we end our sermon series uh, with words to live by, with these important words that we hear from Jesus Christ, out of reverence for Christ and his gospel, would you please stand as you're able, as we read together Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. If you were with us a, a few weeks ago in worship, you, you heard me tell of our uh, first two weeks of the month of July. Uh, some of that time we were on vacation together. Some of that time uh, our family drove up to North Carolina for a church meeting, jurisdictional conference, and uh, got to have some family time up there. And on our way back, we dropped off our oldest son, Joseph, at an overnight camp in the North Georgia mountains. And Elizabeth and I decided that with our younger two, our, our seven-year-old daughter Grace and our uh, three-year-old son Jacob that we would stop and stay over in Atlanta instead of trying to make the whole way back to Dothan. And so uh, after much consideration and conversation about what we would do with one night in Atlanta, we settled on the Georgia Aquarium. It's a wonderful place. I'm not sure if you've been able to take young people there. It's fascinating at any age, but especially to see a seven-year-old and a three-year-old experience the aquarium. Plus, after 5 p.m., you get discounted tickets, and that was about when we'd hit it. And so uh, we, we knew we had three hours to see this place, and, and it really was just just like a movie, walking in and, and seeing our seven-year-old daughter and our three-year-old son, you know, putting their hands and heads up against these massive pieces of glass and watching these huge sea creatures and the sparkle in their eyes and the joy in their words as they explored, you know, huge eels and went into a dark room with sharks and got to peek up their heads and look around and see penguins, you know, standing right there on the other side of the glass next to their faces and touching the rays and then it happened we saw the thing that was the most exciting to Jacob Saliba our three-year-old boy we were on our way to the dolphin show you know where you go to get yourself splashed by a dolphin they call it fun and uh, and, and while we were going to this show he saw what became for him the highlight of his summer really probably the highlight of his entire life he saw the escalator. Friends, he went up this escalator, and he took a left, and he came immediately down the escalator, and he turned around, and he did it again, and he just kept doing it, and he was more excited to ride this escalator than anything we have ever seen him done in his life, and the thought that we would go see a dolphin at this point, now that he was riding the escalator, he could not fathom that we would do anything but ride an escalator. For 35 minutes, he rode up and down an escalator while Elizabeth and I took turns doing things with grace because he wanted, he didn't care we paid $50 for him to see the aquarium. He wanted to ride the escalator. You can go to Wiregrass Commons, into an anchor store, and do it for free anytime. But he doesn't know that because he had not ridden up and down an escalator. And the sheer excitement, I really do think if you asked him, what is your favorite thing to do? He would say, ride an escalator. I mean, that really just it enthralled him. I love that uh, sense of pure, simple bliss that comes from a child. 
Another experience we had uh, is, you know how frustrating it is, at the end of places like aquariums, you go into the gift shops, and they want to sell you uh, a little dolphin, and, and they want $25 for it, and you know that they bought it at Walmart for a dollar, and just stuck aquarium on it, and, and so you think, I don't know if we really need to buy, or those bubble makers that end up in your garage after two hours of lighting and playing music, they never work longer than two hours, but when we got to uh, the, the uh, places like the, the uh, waterfall and sliding rock, the kids all, especially Jacob and Grace, wanted to collect a rock from that place. Now, I love this kind of souvenir for several reasons. One, the price tag. And, uh, and Grace actually collected these two rocks uh, at one of the, the waterfalls we went to. She said, I want to bring one of them home for Pop and one of them home for Granddaddy. This is what she wanted to bring back from her trip for her two granddads were, were these rocks, and they were so important to her. They are so important to her, and they're just this gift given to us from God. Imagine the sheer and amazing joy Peter must have felt when this man whom he had placed his entire belief in turned to him and said, Peter, I am making you the rock of my entire church. I mean, what a gift to Peter. What, what sheer joy, the greatest moment of his life, no doubt. This man that all of his associates had been following and hanging on every word, that this man whom he knew to be the Lord and Savior. In fact, that is what was the, the precursor to Jesus' declaration that Peter would be the rock. Peter gave in word who he knew Jesus to be. He said, you are the anointed one, the Messiah, the Son of God. Peter had received the gift of the Spirit, which was a, a, uh, a belief that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, and then he made a public confession of faith. He declared Jesus as Lord and Savior, and at that moment of declaring his understanding of who Jesus is, he was granted this great gift of assurance. Now, I don't know about you, but if Jesus Christ looked at me, and told me I was going to be the rock of his entire church, and then went on to say, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, I'd probably get a big head. I mean, it would be hard for me to fit through those double doors back there into this sanctuary. Jesus Christ calling me the rock of his church? The, the keeper of the keys of the kingdom? Imagine the pride and the sense of achievement that overcame Peter in that moment best moment of his life. He had pleased his teacher and his master. He had done what would be a great joy for his entire existence. He had gratified Jesus Christ. Peter was the man. And then we get the next verses of Matthew's gospel. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So Jesus unlocks, if you will, by foreshadowing what will happen to him to the disciples in one sentence, this great story that we still lean into and try to discover more fully its meaning in our own lives. Jesus says to them, I will be arrested. I will go through this pain. I will be put to death, but I will be raised, and you will witness all of this. Peter, the rock, the key holder, takes Jesus to the side, man to man, Verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke Jesus, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. What just happened? In one breath, in one moment, 
there he was in verses 19 and 20, the rock, the keeper of the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And now in verses 21 and 22, Peter's being called Satan and a stumbling block to Jesus himself. Well, I don't know about you, but I love Peter. How very human Peter turns out to be when we truly study his story. I, I mean, one minute, the rock of the church, the next minute, he is this stumbling block. He is the standard bearer of the kingdom of God in a, a, a human form, and now he's completely missing and, and not able to comprehend the, the basic gospel story given to him in this sentence from Jesus. Peter didn't always get it. He didn't completely understand. And in his misunderstanding, he would always be brought just to the brink of understanding. And oftentimes, more than not, he'd fall back into confusion rather forward into clarity. How I love Peter and his testimony. Even how he doesn't understand the cross in full. Not at first. But this is who Peter is, and the amazing thing is what we learn about who God is. Because in the midst of all this confusion and misunderstanding and being a stumbling block, Jesus kept calling him, keeps on calling Peter, keeps on encouraging him to be the leader and the disciple that Jesus knows he can be. At some points, we stand in awe of Peter's leadership, and at other points, we see him completely deny Christ in fear. And, and this is how so many of us experience our own walks with Jesus Christ. For you see, Peter is us and we are him. Consider how he was called into discipleship earlier in Matthew's gospel, chapter 4, verse 18. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me. And I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And then from that moment on, Peter becomes this great witness to Jesus' healings and his miracles and his wonder working. He even begot to be one of the disciples who went up that mountain and saw the mysterious transfiguration of our Christ. A normal fisherman called to follow Christ, Christ training him to be the rock. Peter had been chosen, and oh, the joy that flooded his soul. And, and then you remember that scene at the table where Jesus, in an act of witnessing to us what it means to be humble before God and before others, to show mercy, to act in love, he got down on his knees in front of the disciples, and he made his way round the table. And when he came to Peter, this is what the story tells us. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus said, you do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Peter, so devout, so extraordinarily faithful to his Messiah and his teachings, and yet so human, not always fully comprehending the glories of God being done right in his very life. He, like us, didn't always completely understand Jesus, but he sought a greater faith, always seeking greater understanding. Peter didn't always give himself completely over to the life of Christ, because he was still trying to develop the life of Christ within him, just like us. He was sometimes ashamed of the way he fell from Christ, just like us. And at other times, he was assured of his great faithfulness, just like us. And just like us, his faith journey had great highs and great lows, the ups and the downs. In this profound scene from the gospel, after the institution of the Lord's Supper, before Jesus goes into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray... He says these words that oftentimes disturb us. You will all become deserters because of me this night. This is Matthew 26, 31. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, Jesus says, 
I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter said to Jesus, Though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. You hear what he's saying? I've felt like this before. Jesus, I know everyone in this world will desert you, but not me. Not me. I am yours forever. I will follow you forever. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the crock cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. He insists. The only thing he denies is that he will never deny Jesus. And then Jesus is betrayed in the garden. He's arrested. According to Matthew's gospel, while he's at the home of the high priest being interrogated, it is then that in the courtyard, uh, a woman, a servant girl, comes to Peter. This is verse 69. You also were with Jesus the Galilean, but Peter denied it before all of them, saying, I don't know what you're talking about. And when he went out to the porch, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, he denied it, this time with an oath, I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up to said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them. Your accent betrays you. And then he began to curse. He swore an oath, I do not know the man. And at that moment, the cock crowed. And then Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. How we are, Peter. In those moments where we know there is shame and guilt because of an action or a word we've spoken or performed that does deny he is our Lord, that his righteousness is our righteousness. But the good news is, Peter is just like us. And despite our moments of fear and denial, despite our low points along our faith journey, despite sometimes being temptation makers or even temptation followers, Jesus continued to call on Peter and need Peter, and Jesus continues to call on us, desires us. In one of the last encounters Jesus has with Peter, this was just after his resurrection, about a, a, a week later, He's sitting on a beach, he's made a fire, he's cooking breakfast, and he calls Peter towards him. And he says, Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to Peter a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And Peter said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And after this, he said to him, follow me. The first words and the last words that Jesus says to Peter, follow me. Two words. Now, Peter did not always follow him perfectly, but according to Acts, he did follow him well enough to become the leader of the church, a missionary to those outside of the faith, a man who, who became the, the closest thing we've had in Jerusalem at the time right after Jesus' death of being the rock of the church. With Christ at his head, he did feed and he tended and he was called over and over again to follow Christ in this world so desperate for food and for care. Sometimes we're going to be right on target. Sometimes we will feel so entrusted by Jesus Christ that we know when we leave this table, we are one of his great ambassadors, filled with his light and love and shining forth in the dark world. And other times, we're going to feel so far removed from the righteousness of Jesus, we wonder to ourselves, are we a stumbling block to his mission in this world? We all have rough patches of faith, the ups and the downs of discipleship. But like Peter, we are merely human. 
And I believe that one of God's attractions to us is when we acknowledge we are merely human and we come to the table humbly confessing we have not always followed you perfectly. We have not always been a rock for your church, a building block for your kingdom, but we're ready to be called again, sent out to bear your mission in the world to tend your sheep and to feed your lambs and to care for this world. Did you know in Acts chapter 4, it describes a trial that Peter is, is placed before. It's written, when they saw the boldness of Peter and realized that he was an uneducated and an ordinary man, they were amazed and they recognized him as a companion of Jesus. Does the world recognize you as a companion of Jesus? Out in the world, can people say by being in your presence, that's a companion of Jesus? That's one of the rocks of Jesus' church in this world. That's one of the building blocks of the kingdom of heaven right here in the world. Wherever you have been, wherever you are, you are invited to come to this table to be fed, to be cared for, and to be sent out with these two words, follow me. How you answer Jesus' call, it really does define your entire life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.